neutrality as a concept in modern times, I'd see it as taking three different forms. You have passive neutrality, active neutrality, proactive neutrality. Now, passive neutrality is classical neutrality, like Switzerland, like Belgium in the 1800s until the First World War, and like Austria after the Second World War. Switzerland from 1815 onwards, from the Congress of Vienna after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, Belgium after it was created as a buffer state to prevent there being a border for, with France and the Netherlands, and Austria after World War II to block off access to NATO troops between West Germany and Italy, were all declared neutral by other powers in order to guarantee their sovereignty. So these countries became neutral in order to protect their own sovereignty. And there were other countries that guaranteed their independence. What did neutrality mean then? No alliances, no access to their territory for military transport of any country. And it was often backed up by military conscription. So every adult male in these countries was conscripted into the army and the army was purely for self-defense. It didn't have any ambitions for operations outside its territory, for annexing territory, for operations abroad. So that's passive neutrality, which is defensive. It doesn't give you a big voice on the stage, but you can leverage it as the League of Nations, for example, was headquartered in Switzerland, or many UN offices were headquartered in Switzerland, but Switzerland only joined the UN in 2004, saying joining the UN is a violation of our neutrality. We can't do that. So it took them 189 years to even accept that neutrality is compatible with joining a multilateral diplomacy forum. Then you have active neutrality. Active neutrality is a more recent concept. So after the Second World War, you had countries like Finland, which was neutral. You had countries like Yugoslavia, which was non-aligned, one of the leading non-aligned powers. You had Cyprus, you had Malta, you had uh, countries in the developing world, in the global south who did not want to be pulled into either the Eastern or Western Bloc, but wanted to play both sides, enjoy good relations with all, and uh, keep their fingers out of messy situations. So not get dragged into conflicts. So they didn't join NATO or the Warsaw Pact. They didn't join SEATO or CENTO or uh, any of these encumbering alliances. That was strategic autonomy. And then you have proactive neutrality of which there was only really one example, and that was Sweden. So Sweden, after the late 60s, under Prime Minister Olaf Palme, said that he had a very different visualization of what neutrality means. And he famously said, neutrality does not condemn us to silence. In fact, it gives you a greater opportunity, a greater platform, a moral platform, in which you can decide for yourself what your self-interests are and what is morally right or wrong based on your country's values. So Sweden, despite being neutral, was very open in condemning the US in the Vietnam War, or it was very open in condemning the coup d'etat against Allende by Pinochet in Chile in 1973, and was also quite happy to give diplomatic support to the African National Congress and to SWAPO in Namibia in their struggles for independence against apartheid. So this is something that many people don't realize. They think neutrality just means being like Switzerland, staying out of everything and uh, hiding people's money. There's many forms of neutrality. In India, unfortunately, we didn't view neutrality as a means of safeguarding our sovereignty, nor as a platform for expressing our interests, and instead used it as a moral force. It's like the Satyagraha of... uh, of geopolitics to allow us to punch above our weight. If you go to the UN and give a speech about Panchil or give a speech about these values uh, that you hold so dear and ahinsa, non-violence and pacifism. But that is something you can only do once you have your sovereignty safeguarded, once you have your national interest defined. And then you should use this messaging to further that. But if you just take the aesthetics of values without any power to back it up, then people can see that that's shallow and then they don't buy into it. And that's an issue that after independence, we wanted all of the trappings of a great power, of an independent country, of a sovereign state, without building the fundamentals. You need a national identity, you need national interests, you need a national narrative, and then you can defend it. Otherwise, you're just defending abstract values and you don't even have the tools to 
push them. 